Welcome back, everyone, as we continue our look at the story of one of the most interesting and influential women in history that maybe you don't know a lot about, Eleanor of Aquitaine. This is episode three. If you have not seen the first two episodes of my reaction series, there's a link in the description that will take you back to the beginning. Please check that out and get caught up. Come back here. If you want to see episode three from Extra History without my commentary, that link is also in the description, as well as some other links, including some of my other channels and my podcast things for you to check out when you have the chance. And if you think I've earned it by the end of this video, please consider subscribing if you haven't already. Let's go ahead and dive into part three. Spring, 1173, Aquitaine. Henry's sons are in revolt, gone to Paris to ally with Eleanor's ex-husband Louis and his son Philip, and Eleanor is on the road. Her goal is unclear. She hasn't rebelled against her husband, but also hasn't condemned her three rebel sons or raised troops for Henry to use. Rumor has it she may be headed for Paris herself, and court gossip even swirls that she instigated this whole standoff as part of a dark plot. So Henry's soldiers capture her on the road and take her back to him. She will now be her husband's captive as well as his queen. Insurance that Aquitaine will not revolt and a hostage to try to bring her sons to the negotiating table. So just think about all the politics involved here because this is a unique situation in history where you have a queen who has this much power and influence in her own right. It doesn't happen often. It does happen. Uh, but the the amount of land that she owns that is hers that she has brought into this uh, is huge. But of course now she's got sons, and so the influence is lessened somewhat by her having sons because now there's an heir. So say something happens to her, that goes to her sons. Of course in this case the sons have rebelled, so Henry's got a reason to hang on to her but to also keep her safe, because as long as he's got her, he's got some of that power and influence. And so it's a complicated situation. You, just to put yourself in Henry's situation, you've got his, his three sons that have rebelled against him and the, the power and influence that they have now, that they're adults and now that they have uh, lands of their own. You've got her, you've got the King of France involved in this. It's just a mess. Eleanor, the most powerful woman in Europe, will be a prisoner for the next 16 years. 16 years. Thanks so much to Brilliant for helping us tell today's historical tale. Eleanor of Aquitaine, powerful and savvy, has always attracted a lot of stories. And one of the big ones is that she was some sort of dark mastermind, secretly convincing her sons to rebel. And there's times in history where this happens, right? I mean, uh, Henry VIII accused Anne Boleyn of witchcraft, saying that she used that witchcraft to bewitch him, to put a spell on him, to cause him to divorce his first wife and to marry her. And, you know, of course, none of that ever came up until it was convenient to get rid of her. And so he started allowing these stories to be out there. And so what's... You know, one of the key aspects of bringing down an opponent. It's slander. It's putting stuff out there that will cause people to turn against you. You know, we see that throughout history too. You want to bring somebody down, you start putting stuff out there that's going to poison people's minds against them. However, that's not accurate. Now, don't get us wrong. Eleanor wasn't above using her kids as chess pieces. That was actually kind of her whole thing. But by most accounts, she wasn't even around when young Henry finally snapped and decided to challenge his father. If she had been pulling the strings, Henry probably would have divorced her and kept her in worse conditions. But as had been the case with her divorce from Louis, court figures found Eleanor a convenient scapegoat to blame the rebellion on. You know, rather than Henry deciding to make his son co-ruler, but then giving him no actual power. For a decade, Eleanor was removed from the political board, unable to see her children, and confined in luxurious solitude at English castles. While she was allowed to appear at Christmas courts, otherwise she watched from the sidelines as her family tore itself apart. To put it simply, while Eleanor was imprisoned, her sons raised rebellions and fought their father, surrendered, went back to crush the rebellions they'd caused, then fought each other. Though that was kind of par for the course for Henry's family. In fact, Henry's bloodline, the Plantagenets, were so known for their anger issues and infighting that one of their nicknames was the Devil's Brood. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, and if you want a good book, people are always asking me for book recommendations. A fantastic book on this family is The Plantagenets by Dan Jones. Highly recommend it. 
According to legend, they were descended from a marriage between a French noble and the literal daughter of Satan. But I digress. So what did Eleanor think about this familial civil war? Well, like so many things with her, the documents don't tell us directly and we have to read between the lines. And for Rob's part, he thinks this is where Eleanor entered the final phase of her life. The first phase had been about protecting her own power as Lord of Aquitaine. The second was about founding the Angevin Empire with her marriage to Henry and securing its future through producing children. So again, the Angevins, uh, this is based on the them being from the Counts of Anjou. Uh, Anjou being kind of this area here. You've got Normandy. You know, look at how much territory. There's as much, if not more, territory being controlled in France than there is in England itself at this point. But now, her great work was to keep this red-haired devil's brood from tearing apart what she and Henry had built, a task that would encompass the rest of her life. See, she was essentially living out her own political ambitions through her sons and yep. building Angevin power through her daughter's marriages. And, and this is really how, for most of this time in history, women exert their influence, is through the children they're able to provide. Uh, and whatever level of influence they can have over their husbands and their children. And then the occasional opportunity where women have to rule themselves, which doesn't come along all that often and only happens in certain places. This third and final phase began in 1183, when Eleanor had a dream where she saw her son Henry wearing two crowns, one atop the other, the crown of eternal life above that of his earthly power. Mm -hmm. Soon, she got the news that he had died of dysentery while campaigning against Richard. This dream haunted Eleanor, especially since one of Henry's deathbed acts was to beg the king to release her. Richard was now the heir presumptive, and that was a problem, because King Henry thought Richard would be too powerful if he was both heir to England and Duke of Aquitaine. So as a condition of becoming heir, he ordered Richard to give up Aquitaine to his no longer landless brother, John. See, while most of the family considered John irresponsible and duplicitous, he had never joined his brothers in rebellion and therefore had become Henry's favorite. Oh, yeah, Richard refused. As a compromise, Henry wheeled Eleanor out of captivity so Richard could formally hand Aquitaine back to her, letting Eleanor re-enter politics in a limited capacity. And remember, this Richard that we're talking about is the Richard that we know today as Richard the Lionheart, and John is someday going to be king and prove himself really not up to the task after all. Oh, and John, as you can imagine, just loved being passed up again. Eleanor was still a captive and kept within Henry's sight. However, her movement became less restricted. But that missing decade had also changed her family. Her children were now adults, and apart from helping negotiate the marriage of two of her daughters to the King of Sicily and the King of Castile, she really had no part in their lives. A thing that only became more tragic, since three years after losing Henry, Geoffrey also died in a freak jousting accident, and in June 1189, her eldest daughter Matilda, Duchess of Saxony, also passed away. In her life, Eleanor had been so lucky as a mother. Only one of her ten children, eight with Henry, had died before adulthood. Which is a ridiculous miracle at this time in history to have nine of your ten children reach adulthood. I mean, it's really pretty unheard of. Uh, if you look at the children of monarchs even hundreds of years later, it just didn't happen that often. Plus, she herself had survived again and again the lethality of medieval pregnancy and childbirth. But now that lucky streak seemingly ended, and the next death changed everything. Days after Matilda's death, Richard, again in revolt, this time alongside Louis's son, King Philip II of France, defeated Henry in battle. And having been sick for many years spent campaigning, Henry then confirmed Richard as his heir and withdrew to his capital at Chino. And there, the man who had been Eleanor's husband, lover, and jailer, finally died. Richard's first act as king was to send word across the channel that his mother was to be freed and treated as acting on his behalf in all things. And notice, of course, Richard's not in England, and he's barely ever going to be in England. I think in his 10-year reign, he spends something like six months in England. It kind of shows you, I mean, part of it is just who Richard is and the nature of his kind of warlike nature and and going on crusade and, and fighting in France and things like that. But it also gives you a little bit of a glimpse into how England was viewed by the Angevins in these early years. It was almost like it was secondary to their holdings in France. Eleanor emerged from her imprisonment more powerful than she'd ever been. While not officially regent, it was understood that she acted for Richard and that her word was his. 
As her first act, this dowager queen, formerly imprisoned by her husband, toured England to release Henry's other political prisoners, a personal gesture to win back loyalty for Richard and separate him from his father. Yep. Her next task was to make Henry's final arrangements. And in what has been read as a symbolic gesture, she had his body sent to an abbey in Aquitaine on her lands. There, in a building run by women, she put him in a tomb slightly lower than the one she later built for herself. She literally buried him. And when Richard... And one of the sad, unfortunate things about these kings that have been buried in France, including people uh, like uh, Henry, Richard the Lionheart will be another one, um, is that during the French Revolution, a number of them, uh, their bones were scattered and uh, desecrated. And we've really, I mean, their tombs are still there, but the, the bones are long since gone or have been jumbled up with all the other bones that were in those locations returned to England in September of 1189, it was Eleanor who arranged his coronation. But as soon as he was crowned, he started preparing to leave. See, two years earlier, Richard heard that Saladin had taken Jerusalem and swore to join the Third Crusade. Now, Eleanor was dubious about this idea, having been on crusade herself and knowing how dangerous it could be. Richard should be securing his throne by fixing the damages the war yep. had wrought, as well as marrying and producing heirs. So you can kind of start to see a little bit how the reign of Henry and now the reign of Richard, kind of neglecting England the way that they have, can set some of the stage for what's going to happen with John. So while John is going to, he's going to succeed Richard, while he's going to make mistakes of his own, and he certainly does himself no favors, uh, he comes into a pretty tough situation that he only makes worse. Uh, so it might not have gotten to the point that it did with John had things not been so bad for so long. Uh, but still, he makes his own bed. But Richard didn't really care about England, you know, apart from taxing it to fund wars. So instead, he liquidated the treasury, raised a special tax to fund his crusade, then just left for years. Now, you can hear more about Richard's adventures in our Saladin series, but from Eleanor's perspective, he basically left her to sort out the mess, including his marriage. For 20 years, Richard had been betrothed to King Philip's half-sister Alice, the daughter of Eleanor's ex-husband Louis, by his second wife. But Richard and Philip's alliance was rickety, and for years, Richard's father had made Alice his mistress so she wasn't suitable, which made it basically a deal-breaker. Eleanor instead proposed Berengaria of Navarre, whose Spanish province protected Aquitaine's southern border and where the culture was similar to Aquitaine. But Richard was already headed out to the Holy Land, meaning Berengaria had to be delivered to him en route for the marriage to take place. So a lot of people try to claim, oh, Richard the Lionheart was homosexual. and um, I think it's a thing we like to try and apply to anybody who doesn't produce children in a marriage in history. And, and may some of those historical figures have been homosexual or bisexual? Certainly possible. There's no reason for them to have made a big deal of that and made it known publicly, which is why people speculate. But in this case, there are a lot of other factors into why Richard doesn't have any children uh, that have nothing to do with his sexuality. So, Eleanor had to cross the Pyrenees into Spain, pick Berengaria up, travel back across the mountains, overland through Europe, cross the Alps, and board a ship to meet Richard in Sicily. Keep in mind, she was almost 70. Whew, that finally done. She returned to England and found the place in chaos. Yeah. Richard's Council of Regents had fell to infighting, and who was there to take advantage? John, the untrustworthy baby of the family. He'd taken London and set up a rival court there, claiming that he'd saved England from corrupt and incompetent regents and that he was the natural successor, considering Richard was unmarried, had no children, and let's be honest, was probably dead by now. So this is the time period in which you have the Robin Hood stories set, right? He's Prince John at the time, but he's usurping his brother's authority. He's corrupt and he's a tyrant and he's doing all of this stuff. This is that time period when we see that stuff taking place. But when word of Richard's marriage filtered back via Eleanor and returning knights, John's brief appearance of legitimacy faded. And incredibly, the family just sort of smoothed it over. I mean, you know John, right? Ah, I'm sure he won't cause any more trouble. Except he would. Because in 1192, word reached England that Richard the Lionheart, hero of the crusade, had secured the coastal crusader states from Saladin and was headed back home, but then vanished. 
the King of England just disappeared from the map. Kidnapped. John, claiming his brother was dead and that he was the rightful king, took a ship for France and entered an alliance with King Philip, leaving Eleanor to find and rescue one son while protecting his crown from the other. You can see why this is such a fascinating story and how Eleanor is right at the center of all of it, of a very interesting family. Uh, it's, it's really cool stuff, and, and it's one of the reasons I'm so drawn to this period of history because there's so much intrigue and uh, there's so much that's interesting about the personalities involved. And like I said, check out uh, The Plantagenets by Dan Jones. Fantastic book about these events and the events that follow from there. So let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. Please hit that like button. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.